go out there and rate them roads from a one, that means that road is falling apart, to a 10 freshly paved road. Um, the slide also talks about, on the average, it'll cost the average Wisconsin citizen $637 for repairs. You know, that's your struts, shocks, tire rims, blowouts, just because of bad roads. They figure that's the average of 637. Here in Marathon County, we have 614 miles of county highways. Um, all of those, as our last rankings going, um, we show about 20% of our roads are in excellent condition. That's at nine to 10, that PACER rating I spoke of a little while ago. 40% um, are in good, that's the seven to eight rating we have. Infrastructure one on record probably uh, five, seven years ago already saying, that's our goal. We don't wanna be below that seven mark. So that, that's where we're sitting. Uh, right now on five to six, that's a fair. We have 35% of roads and 5% of our roads are in poor condition. Structurally for our bridges, we have 14 bridges. Uh, we actually have 110 bridges on the county system. 14 of those right now are structurally deficient. Um, so we're at about 13%. We're well over that was uh, average for Wisconsin. And um, we also have 885 miles of state roads we take care of. 168 state bridges and 240 municipal bridges. By state statute, we are in charge of all the local municipal bridges also. So if Richard has a bridge out in his township, um, he's financially responsible for it, but uh, it comes under our umbrella. So when we get that pot of money from the feds every five years for bridge repair, we have to incorporate our bridges along with all the municipal bridges. Um, right now, as far as the, the bridges go, we're replacing one of them this year on the county system, just kind of giving you an idea of a cost. It's out in the town uh, out east on Highway Z, out in the town of Easton, Plover out there. That one bridge alone is gonna run us $1.2 million. Um, about 70% of that is covered under the federal program. Right now, that bridge program I spoke about, it's a five-year program. In the middle of the program we're in right now is 2017 through 22. So time I get the next program, we're gonna be talking out to 26. This is just a snapshot of the county uh, county budget we took from uh, your program from last year. As you see, there's 19% of the budget on transportation. Highway doesn't get that whole 19. There's, there's other uh, departments that get some of that, but uh, what we do get is the 24.5 million dollars of that. And if you look at that pie chart, about one third of uh, that goes on building our infrastructure between the asphalt paving and infrastructure construction, that bridges and other aspects and the paving. Um, you see a big piece of that chai up in the pink up there, probably from 10 o'clock to 12, 3.3 million in state maintenance. We have an annual contract with the state of Wisconsin, a routine maintenance agreement. That is 100% reimbursable. Um, and then you see the other part of it is general maintenance and winter maintenance. Um, we're eating away at that corner of the pie right now. So where else do we get our money from? A lot of times you hear GTA. What is GTA? General Transportation Aids. It's the second largest program in WSDOT's budget. Largest being construction and then uh, it's GTA. Um, how GTA is actually based on is our six year average. So what we end up doing is um, our finance department compiles our six-year average and we send that off to the state. They have a share of cost of percentage that they give us. So the state of Wisconsin, they get a piece of pie for GTA. That pie ranges from year to year. And then we get a piece of that pie. Originally, GTA was supposed to fund 30% of our cost. So they say, Marathon County, your cost is X amount. We're gonna give you 30% to help cover. The other 70% is on you. We've seen that number die down. We, uh, it's been since the 1990s, the last time we've seen that 30%. Um, in 2009, it was at 22.5. Um, this year, it's actually at 19.07. Here's just some of the numbers going back 10 years. You can see back in 2010, we were at $3.3 million. Things are looking good. And all of a sudden, the bottom started to fall out. Um, it's based on a couple of things, again, that six-year average. So if we don't spend money, you're gonna say, all right, we're not gonna spend, we're gonna spend down. It's just gonna come back in a big circle because our six year average starts to drop at that point. I just picked a few years so you can see that share of costs I spoke about. Back in 2009, that share of costs was at 22.5. Um, 
Um, 15 was down to 18.53. Now this last year came back up just slightly to 19.07. Far, far away from that 30% that we're supposed to be. Um, if you figure we're $33,000 less than we were 10 years ago, if you just figure a flat 2% annual cost since 2009, we'd be at 3.9 million right now. That, that'd be another 800,000 to help us up. If that share of cost would have just stayed the same at 22.5 since 09, we'd be at 3.7. If we'd have that 30% like we we're supposed to have, um, when it was originally attended to, we'd be at 4.9, almost $5 million. Again, we're, not, we're nowhere close to that. Um, so what else do we have? We have registration fee. A few years back, we decided that we can't meet ends meet. Uh, we needed some help, so we, we enacted the registration fee. Um, currently, we're getting about $3 million a year out of our registration fee. So what is registration fee? A lot of people call it the wheel tax, and there's some confusion because I've heard a couple people, all right, so I got four tires on my car. Do I got to pay 100 bucks. Now it's this... $30, uh, it's, our, it's our fee of $25 for automobiles under 8,000 um, pounds. Again, it's $25, gives us about $3 million a year. There are some vehicles that are exempt. I've got a whole long list here. I'm not going to go through them. Um, Jim Schaefer can drive all of his uh, old hobbies cars because they're all exempt. All the antique cars are all there. Um, also with that, if you remember when we acted this, there was uh, just 12 people that had registration fee just a few years back when we did that. Now you've seen how long that list has grown. Uh, there's now 29 municipalities in the state of Wisconsin with registration or wheel tax, depending on what they call it. Um, and I know there is probably about four or five more counties coming soon. I've had commissioners call me from around the state asking me for direction because they're, they're looking at doing it. So I, I, my best guess, is right now it says nine out of 72 counties. If there's no change in legislation, GTA uh, funding that we're gonna get, I, I would be uh, willing to bet in another four years, you're probably gonna see that number double. What's that money being used for? It can't, uh, no, nobody township or city can be exempt. So when you enact it, everybody's in it, okay? Or we had a few questions when we first did it, well, could we give the townships and municipality two dollars of that twenty-five we're collecting? State law does not allow us to do it. It needs to be spent on the who's ever collecting those funds. It needs to be collected on their county roads or bridges. So, where's all that money going? Um, I just picked a few of our major costs here. Uh, our, these are our big ticket items. As you see, for the last ten years, our asphalt has gone from thirty-seven dollars a ton. Uh, we're projecting it this year to be about $53 a ton. We use 85,000 tons of asphalt a year. That's just the raw material. That's not us laying it down yet. That's just FOB at the plant. Um, salt, you, you see that number has gone from 65 up to almost $85. We use anywhere from 10,000 to 12,000 tons of salt a year. So if you start doing that math, you see where that money goes in a hurry. Our truck replacement, um, from nine to now, it's gone from 177,000 up to 253. I know when uh, I first became commissioner 13 years ago already, one of the first things I did is I, I talked to Brad and I said, we used to have the $20,000 under $20,000, we could go out and just get coats for a vehicle. That worked great. We could go buy pickups and those little things without going through a whole long braiding process. Uh, we bumped it up to 30,000, we thought we were set. Uh, right now, we can't hardly go buy a pickup. Uh, last year, we did a trade-in. We got very good price for trade-in. Um, we can't even buy a pickup truck. The prices are going up. We've been held at the $956,000 every year to replace our equipment. And that's uh, all of our equipment. That's just not these trucks that you see are 253. If I need to go buy a new paver, I'm looking at three hundred forty dollars to $350,000 for a paver. So really, I buy a paver and I buy two trucks, I don't have much left for our fleet. So um, again, that hasn't changed in uh, quite a few years. This is just a, a map of projects that we have upcoming. Uh, the yellow is what we're gonna be doing this year, and the green is next year, and the little red dots are bridges. Um, so you can see we're kind of scattered around the county. We've been applying for more and more federal money. 
Um, with that federal money, there is a little stipulation that we can't do the work with our county forces. So that means when we're out there paving those roads, we lose the ability to take our crews. It means we're doing stuff, other stuff with them. Helps us uh, catch up on routine maintenance. But again, we got some other guys we need to, uh, we're, we're paying a contractor plus we're paying our guys. Uh, this year we have two federal projects, the Highway F project way up in that northwest part of the county from the county line out to 97. Uh, we're getting about $1.5 million, and Highway N from the city limits out past the golf course out to Highway X, we're getting about $485,000 for those projects. In uh, 2021, we're going to be tackling Highway K, one of our uh, most dangerous roads as far as accidents go. Um, so we're doing, uh, we've received funding, $1.5 million for safety improvements. We also received what's called STP Urban, which is surface transportation urban dollars in the WASA. There's a box around WASA. We got money for that. And on the far end, we took rural money. So we're getting all kinds of different pots of money for that. But that's going to be a 2021 project. I will let Kevin get into uh, his asphalt a little bit more. Thank you. Um, we put together a little bit of information on kind of the construction projects we do. So we have a shot of our asphalt paver there. And on the top, the prices that you see there, that's if we are paving one mile of road, 24 feet wide. So that's basically the, the width of the two driving lanes at four inches thick, which is kind of our, our standard county highway typical section. So back in 95, just buying the asphalt for that was about $45,600 for one mile. This year, we're looking to be around $166,000 for that. Um, we usually add on, it's about fifty dollars to $60,000 more for the prep work, the trucking, the paving, the striping, the shouldering, all the work that comes with that. That, that asphalt, the raw material product, makes up about 75% of, of our construction costs on there. So that's been, since 95, it's been about a 5.5% annual increase in, in the cost of, of our biggest raw product. So historically, we used to go out, our roads would, they'd be new, they'd go through life, they'd come to the end of their life, we would uh, pulverize them and repave them with four inches of asphalt. So the shot on the left is our a pulverizer, that's just a machine comes through, takes a paved road and, and leaves gravel behind it. Our crews come through with the, the grading operations there, compact it, grade it, shape it, and uh, we come through and, and pave it after that. We've uh, added some, some specialized equipment to this. If you've ever driven down a road where like every 130 feet, you notice there's like a series of potholes, series of potholes, series of potholes. You get that from end of load segregation. That's how long one load of asphalt goes in the paver. So whenever you get to the beginning and the end of the load, the loads get a little segregated and mixed up and we'd get roads that were in decent shape except for a series of potholes every 130, 140 feet. So we added, uh, it's called, um, an MTV material transfer vehicle in there, and we require that on all of our paved roads now. It, instead of the trucks dumping into the paver, they dump into the, the material transfer. It mixes and keeps it all a homogenous mix and dumps it straight into the paver so we get rid of one of those early failures that we were having on there. We've also done some pilot projects with cold in place recycling. We have quite a few counties that call us for information on our specs on what we've been doing. Rather than taking that road and grinding it up and making gravel out of it, we're making a stabilized um, paving layer out of it. So you see the front end on the, on the left side, there's, you can just so see a little bit of the tanker in there. We mix uh, fresh asphalt oil and water together. We blend it up. The white machine is an asphalt mill. It blends it up into a gravel, injects that oil into it. And then uh, the blue screen or the blue machine back there you can kind of see towards the back is a crushing and screening plant. And then we dump that straight into a paver and we roll it out and that becomes our new foundation for our road. So we were able to use this and um, we, we have about, I think we're about 15 to 18 miles right now we have down of it. And we have about three years of experience. It's been, it's been performing pretty well and it was coming in, instead of spending about 200,000 a mile for a road, we were spending about 155,000. So it was saving us about 25% on our paving costs. So I apologize, I'm not sure what happened to my picture when we brought it over, the one on the left was showing that paver. But the one on the right is the, the finished product. The black road on the left is what it looks like after that cold in place process. And the grayed out road on the right is the lane that the guys did not do yet. 
And after that process, our guys come through with that our regular asphalt paver and put a we have to put a fresh surface layer of hot mix over the top to seal it. But instead of putting four inches of that asphalt, which costs $166,000 a mile, we can cover this with about two inches of asphalt because it's already a, a structural layer that we're putting in there. We've also done a lot of thin overlays. Uh, thin lays is kind of a trademark name for those. It's uh, typically about an inch of asphalt. So we're going over an existing road and just literally putting a fine layer of, uh, it's, a, it's a higher quality mix, it's a more expensive mix, but it's, the volume is significantly less of it. So what I show on the left, we had a road that was paved back in 95. And if you can see up way towards the top of the screen, there, it looks like a newer road there. The road on the bottom is the, the same road as the road that's on the right side. It's just the thin overlay is that road on the right side. And that's how the road looked 10 years after that thin overlay was put down. So you're looking at the same road just about 200 feet away from it. And that's a surface treatment of about $55,000 per mile. And it gave us 10 years of a nice high quality road where the section we did not treat with that, you can see the, the cracking and we ended up actually having to um, go in and cold in place recycle the rest of that road. Well, that thin overlay we put down back in 2008 is still in service and a, a fairly smooth riding road for us. So we have been, we're just trying to show you some of the innovations we have where traditionally years back it was you grind up a road, shape it, and put new asphalt on it. For pavement preservation, we, we try to put a stronger emphasis on pavement preservation these days taking our good roads and trying to keep them in good roads. So we do a lot of crack sealing with our crews. We do chip sealing, and then I mentioned that thin overlay. That's, it's in our paving program, but it actually probably falls more into the pavement preservation. So you see a little shot of our uh, chip spreader there, the fresh black oil down on the road, and quarter inch stones that go on top of it. Traditionally, these used to go down on older roads that were falling apart, and they really didn't do anything to preserve what was there because the roads were already falling apart. We've been putting them on, on one-year-old roads now, one- and two-year-old roads, to seal up those roads and preserve them. And the best analogy I have, I have for that, because the road looks rougher, it's a gravelly surface for a little while, it's not as nice and smooth as that fresh asphalt, but the, the best analogy is compare it to your wood deck. Do you wait until your wood deck is oxidized and deteriorated and then put your water seal on it? Or do you put your seal on right away to try to keep that wood in its best condition? And that's the effort we're doing with chip seal is rather than letting that asphalt sit out there and have the water hitting it, the snow, the ice, and the, the sun, we're protecting it and preserving it in its early years to get the longest life out of the asphalt. There's a shot of the thin overlays. You can see it just uh, it's an inch layer that goes right on top of the road. One of the other benefits of that is we're laying that through a straight asphalt screed, which is the same shape as our straight asphalt plows. So when winter comes, um, snow removal mechanically with a metal blade is the most efficient way to remove your snow and ice versus, the, versus using more chemicals. So when we lay this down, another <coughs> side effect that's a positive side effect is we have a smoother surface for our plows to be able to remove more of that snow and ice on their first passes with the snow with a snowplow instead of using the, uh, the salts and the sands to work on it. So this is a showing, the, the red line is the performance curve of a road that you just, you build and you don't do anything with it. It kind of hits that peak. If you've ever been on a road that you travel frequently, towards the end of its life, all of a sudden in like three, four years, it takes this big nosedive in, in its performance as the potholes really, really form. Um, we're trying to do the black lines up there and getting some more lower cost early preservation treatments to, to take that life out and extend it further down. We've also looked at some annualized cost for this. So we look at taking a, a brand new road and we annualize that cost over 20 years. It comes out to about $14,800. We add in the cost of an early chip seal and we extend it out for about three years, knowing that we get two to five years out of it, plus the asphalt's usually in a little bit better condition throughout its life, and it's about a $14,400 cost. And then we also looked at that same model and we added around year 15, we put that thin overlay in at 55,000, and that annualized cost came out to about $14,600. So the gist of it is we're getting fairly similar cost per year to have these roads. And if things like the thin overlay give us a better performing road at the end of its life, it's a better, better return for the taxpayers and kind of the model we've been pushing a little bit more these days. Our construction crews provide a, 
a variety of services. Most of them are on our county system and many of them are for the townships as well. Um, I just wanted to hit on a few of theirs. Our guys can go from putting in a 15 inch driveway culvert one day to a 20 foot wide concrete box culvert the next week that weighs 40,000 pounds. So um, the shot up on the upper left, that's uh, on Bear Lake Road up in the northeast part of the county. We did a reline project for the township up there. The bottom left is a bridge replacement project, and I'll, I'll have a bigger slide of that in a minute. The one on the bottom right is that 20 foot wide concrete box culvert out on Highway Double N. It was a million pounds of concrete that got placed in one day on that project. <clears throat> this is just some routine ditching. We do roadside work to maintain positive drainage away from our roadways. Water's kind of the enemy of our pavements. Uh, this is on Oak Road down by our Mosinee shop. They're triple aluminum culverts that we put in to replace some steel culverts that had failed. This is a culvert extension. If you see back behind the guys, it was a very steep slope. You kind of needed a, a rope to walk, or a rope or a ladder to walk up and down it. So we put a 10 foot extension on to build a safer slope next to the highway. This is our lane wedging. It's kind of a crude operation, but it's uh, effective. When we have rutting that's going on, if you ever see water in the wheel pass, it's kind of hazardous. Plus it adds up for, for ice and gets, we can't remove it with the plows because the plows bridge over it. So the guys will go out and uh, we use a fine asphalt mixture and we run it through our lane wedger to fill in those ruts. This is out on Highway 29 doing concrete repairs. If anybody's ever traveled out in Richard's neck of the woods into Wassa, um, you've seen the concrete patches out there. We, I don't even know, do you know a number that we do of those each year? 50, 60? We'll spend weeks out there, basically, and uh, you see the guys are working next to live traffic back there, right behind them. You're not done yet, either. No, we're not done. <laughs> so this is uh, Highway M right by 153. It's, a, it's an aluminum structure. Uh, you see it has a concrete footing with an aluminum kind of a bottomless box culvert is what they call it. Uh, this was a bridge our guys took out on Monday, and on Thursday the road was back open to traffic. Uh, there's a look at the finished product. Bridge crew, I'll let Jim take over on the bridges. I'm back. Uh, so we're about the only county in the state that has our own bridge crew. Uh, what we call our bridge crew, I mean, our, our guys go out there and we build bridges from ground on up. What we can do is we can build that bridge cheaper than we can get a contractor. Plus, one year I we went into design and I called up the person that was doing design on she shot me a price. I said, that price is unbelievable high. And I said, you realize this is just a straight county bridge. We're not running through the whole federal program. Oh, not 35% off. That's how fast I could drop that price because we're doing it in-house. Um, we've been doing one a year. You can see the list of the, uh, the bridges we've been doing uh, for the last five years. I, uh, I had a list, and this, Brad has it on my work plan every year. Now, I'll just hold it up. Um, these are a list of the bridges from this black line up. These are all the bridges I talked about earlier that have this structurally deficient from 50 on down. Those are all the bridges. So once I got highlighted, um, we've gotten taken care of a little bit, but I still have a lot of bridges in this program, um, 18 of them, matter of fact, that are unfunded. So an average bridge, like I said, a bigger one, like Highway Z, we're talking 1 million, 1.5 million, a smaller structure. If we're building it, we can probably do small structures the 35 to 40 foot length ones for a little over $300,000. But I have 18 of them between uh, the county and uh, the township to uh, complete during the next few years. Uh, the bridge crew also does thousands of feet of guard, guardrail and uh, cable guard replacement. Every time it snows like this, we lose more and more and more. So uh, once the snow ever stops, our, our bridge crews will be uh, pretty busy just doing that type of stuff. Then we have our shop. We have nine full-time mechanics, a full-time welder, a stockroom clerk, and a purchasing agent. We used to go and buy the chassis, just like that, and then we would send it out, and they would do parts of it, and we would do parts of it. We would put the hydraulics on it. About two years ago, we put, we put pencil to paper, and we said, we can build these in-house cheaper and get a better product. Because what's happening is every year we have to, of course, bid that out. And one year company A would have it, and they would build it a certain way. Next year company B would have it, they'd build it a little bit different. Next year company C would have it, also we're back to A. A truck breaks down on the road, a hydraulic hose broke. What length is it? No idea. Now we know exactly every truck is built the same. 
We build it with stainless steel lines. We don't have the hydraulic issues anymore. So we, we take it from that to that in-house now. Um, so when truck 160, if something happens on that truck, if a hydraulic line breaks down, we ask them what, what line it's going, we know exactly what it is to repair that truck. Um, and again, we're saving money by doing this. And of course, there's winter maintenance, which I'm really getting sick of. <laughs> um, last year, we have to record every winter maintenance project, uh, every winter maintenance event to the state. So I'm just, I don't have the numbers, of course, for 18, 19, but in 17, we had 112 storm events. Um, there's the salt usage we had. We don't use as much on the county as the state. Uh, we do use more sand salt on the county than the state. So those are the numbers that we used last year. Again, the salt prices for the last three years, it was 77, dropped down a little bit. Now this year it jumped up to 85 bucks a ton. So again, if you start figuring out those prices, uh, the numbers start getting staggering. And then everybody can remember last April 14th through the 16th. What fun was that, huh? That was a good time. Um, we, uh, we got out there and we started working on that. And after the project got over, we just started to run some numbers just on that storm. It started to snow, if you can't remember, which I tried to put out of my mind as much as I can. Uh, it started to snow on Friday night, 11 o'clock and it went through Tuesday. So I just ran the numbers for just the 14th, 15th, and 16th. Doesn't even include the cleanup. By the numbers, these are combined city, I mean, excuse me, county and state together. We used over 703 tons of salt. We used 513 tons of sand salt. This next number is the one that just amazes me. This is in three day period. We used 13,221 gallons of fuel in those three days. Our, our trucks are averaging, because it was so wet and heavy, we average anywhere from two to two and a half miles per gallon that week, uh, pushing snow. That total cost of that storm, just for those three days, was over $300,000. Um, what we got here thrown at us last week, I haven't had the chance to run those numbers yet. Um, I'm sure we're approaching that if we're not gonna go over the top of that with the ice event we had before all the uh, snow came, so. Um, the money goes out in a hurry, unfortunately. We have been also using best practice and innovation in our brining system. Um, we bought two high capacity briners this year. And what salt brine is, is only 23% salt and 77% water. We use that brining for a couple different purposes. In the beginning of the year, uh, when we know these frost events are coming out, you may see us out there and there's not much scheduled for storms and you'll see us on the road brining putting salt brine down. What that does is we look at the forecast. We're having high humidity and the temperature's dropping down to 30 degrees. Even there's no snow in the forecast, we're gonna have frost conditions. This past year, we don't have enough equipment to go all over the roads. So what we've seen this last year, when we start putting that brine down, the roads that we hit two days earlier, wide open, not a condition. The roads that we didn't get into, ice conditions all over the place. So we're, we're seeing that advantage of going out there and putting down that brine. That brine, um, you see in the next slide, it only costs us like 15 cents to make. Um, each one of these high capacity makers can make 5,000 gallons of brine per hour. Each one of these machines, however, costs about $100,000 a piece to, pur to purchase. Um, these are paid by Wisconsin <laughs> Department of Transportation. They, paid, they bought about eight briners in the entire state last year. And uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, get through to them and get to the right people, and we, they bought both of our briners. So eight briners, and we bought two of them, so we were pretty happy about that. So far this year, we've already produced about 700,000 gallons of brine. Again, the brine's only 15 cents, and you know I get a lot of people calling me, you're putting that stuff down, it's rusting my car. You know, again, it's, it's only 23% salt, 77% of that is water. The other thing that we use the brine for is uh, putting it on the back of the, on the salt. Because on the back of our trucks, you see tanks, we either have 75 gallons or 150 gallon tanks. And what that brine does by putting it on top of the salt, it does two things for us. One thing it does, it stops the bounce. So if I got a handful of salt and I want to throw it down on this table right next to me, it's just going to scatter all over the place. We figure we lose 25 to 30% just by bounce coming off the back of that truck, bouncing off the highway and laying in a ditch, not doing anything good. So by adding that water, now I got that handful of salt, I add water to it, I throw it down, blooch, 
stays right there, okay? The other thing the water does to it and the brine does is it activates it. Salt needs moisture to begin to work. So instead of waiting for Mother Nature for that salt to draw that moisture out of the air, we're giving that brine right away. So when that hits the ground, that salt starts to work. Um, I'm gonna hit these, a few of them ready. This year alone, we've seen, uh, and we're using a five-year average, and I, and I know we had an easy December, January, uh, but we're getting nailed here in February. Um, we've seen a reduction of salt. <coughs> We've saved about $95,000 we've saved this year alone on salt. So even if we had to buy one of those brine machines, we'll have one of those paid for if we had to pay for it ourselves. We'd have one of those brine machines paid for already by the end of the year, just under salt reduction. I got a lot of my plow drivers are coming in and they have controls on their truck that says how many pounds they're putting down per mile. Very common for our drivers used to say, I'm putting down 400 pounds of salt per lane mile. They're coming in and say, can we get lower numbers on it? And they go in 50 pound increments. And it used to start at 150, 200, 250, 3, 350, and go up from there. We're getting a lot of our drivers coming in now and say, 150 ain't quite enough. Can I, can I get put a new increment in there of 125 or 175? Sure, so we're seeing drivers turn that number down from 400 pounds per lane mile to some cases under 200, depending on the event. The other thing that Brian helps us a lot with is a couple weeks back, we had a real bad ice condition out here on Highway 29, and it was 10 below. We're adding a product called AMP uh, to it, and I gave everybody a little brochure to it. What that AMP does, it lets that salt work at colder conditions. What we did is we tried a couple things out there. It was 10 below, and the road was icing up. We put down salt, didn't work. We tried brine, it didn't work. We put 15% amp into that. We laid the salt down. We came right behind that salt truck with a, a tanker and put brine on top of that truck. 20 minutes later, that road was wide open and cars are doing 65 miles an hour. Um, it works. A couple other little things that we do. Uh, we have an emergency response trailer. We work really closely with the sheriffs on lots of things. Uh, we have a great sheriff's department in this county and we do a lot of work with them. If they have an accident or something, they need to call us, we bring out, we have an emergency response trailer in both Stratford and here in Wausau. Um, we can call guys, they hook onto that trailer and they're, gone, they're on scene. They don't have to worry about going in, trying to figure out where the barricades are to close up a road. Um, if we have a washout in a road, a bridge washes out, right, whatever, we can grab that trailer and have it up and running. Um, we do training with our guys twice a year, uh, always trying to learn, uh, new techniques and trying to keep up with standards. In the spring, we do a training. A lot of times that spring training will work on trenching and shoring things going into the summer. Uh, then during the winter, we'll hit more of the winter events, uh, the plowing. Uh, this past year, when we did our winter thing, um, we didn't know how our guys are gonna buy into the salt brining. There was a little skepticism there from our guys. Is this gonna work and not gonna work? We brought in an expert from the state of Wisconsin, Jim Hughes. Um, and he spoke the benefits of brining, but I think what really caught the guys is Shawano County had just started doing brining last year, and they have a truck actually set up um, that they have no granular material. They just put brine down. We brought in the drivers of the truck. We said, I want our drivers to hear from your drivers how it works. I can sit there all day long and tell them that this is the right way to go, but if we have your coal people from another county, and I said, they bought in hook, line, and sinker, and I'm so proud of our guys for the response that they've given me this year with the salt brine. We're seeing such a reduction of salt, and uh, in my view, we have had lots better roads. Um, and then we do a lot of training in-house, uh, like this picture, you'll see Mary Jo, she came down, did some training, she comes down. Frank comes down, does training, so we kind of catch up with all of our training on our spring and fall training days. Um, before I close, I just want to mention, um, so we went through all these just to show you what we do and our best management practice, and we try the newest innovations out there, trying to give you the best bang for your buck. So um, we'll try things, not everything works, but uh, most time we do a lot of research before we try something, we just don't jump in it. Uh, so we're, we're trying the best management practices, new innovations, new techniques. Uh, there's a lot of things that we do right now that we didn't do five years ago down there. So we're always trying to new, try new ways. Um, so I'd like to thank you for supporting us and uh, we'll continue to build and maintain this network, but we also need your help. 
because we can handle all these phone calls that you hit my mailbox, you didn't plow my road, your guy drives too fast, he doesn't drive fast enough. One of the best ones I had was one year uh, a guy called me and he said that we hit his mailbox and I explained to him that the snow, we're not responsible for the snow. He goes, that mailbox has been here for over 35 years, he said, and I've never had this issue before. I said, it's, excuse me, sir, it's been there for 35 years, same post? Oh, yeah. He goes, never mind, post is probably rotten, huh? We, 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 had another, we had another gentleman call our superintendent one day, and uh, he was complaining that uh, his mailbox was knocked over, that we take too long to get out to his house, and we drive too fast past his house. So Chris asked me, he goes, so in other words, you want me to drive faster out to your place, but slow down when I go past your place. <laughs> exactly. So uh, we'll, we'll deal all those phone calls. But one thing, I never want to get the phone call. I never want to hear on the radio that we've had a worker killed. Just this happened last week down in Milwaukee County, folks. Um, there's too many accidents out there with our road crews. Um, I've been with the county going on 29 years. I've unfortunately seen two fatalities with our workers. I don't want to ever be that person that has to go knock on somebody's door and say, your loved one's not coming home tonight because of a careless driver. So I ask you to put that message out there, everybody you can talk to. I mean, we do everything we can. Um, we work with law enforcement. Again, we work great with the Sheriff's Department. We'll call the Sheriff's Department and say, we're working on Highway 29, could you please come out there and sit in our work zone? A few years back, they sat in our work zone. Speed limit was 45. They, cl they clocked the lady doing 77 miles an hour through our work zone. Two days later, they clocked the same lady coming through at 75. Pe people just don't slow down. We try to educate. We go to uh, schools and talk to driver's ed. This coming year, I'm actually going to the National Association of County Engineers down in Wichita, Kansas, and I'm one of the presenters talking about work zone safety. So we need to start here in Marathon County to try to keep all those workers safe. With that, I'd like to thank you, and uh, John wants to talk about uh, what you can do as county board members. Thank you. Well, when I was talking to Kurt in Lance before the meeting, and we came across this winter storm, the deceptive killers, something that was prepared in 2001 by the Department of Commerce, and it talks about you know, how deadly um, storms can be because of heavy snow, ice, cold, flooding and other things, and we've experienced it all, but I, again, a tribute to our highway crews uh, for the job that they've done. I think what Kevin and Jim have portrayed is that we're a department that, that exercises a lot of best management practices. We do a lot of things right. We try to be innovative, and we try to learn and, and do better. Um, this county board has, over the years, taken a number of stands, and in, in the last 10 years, so we've adopted an um, advisory referendum on a segregated transportation fund with the thought that it would create more dollars for uh, county general transportation aides uh, to help us with that. In 2013, we adopted a, a resolution as a board in favor of transit transportation funding. In 2016, we adopted support for the Just Fix It uh, effort to have a reasonable um, bonding approach to bonding for our, our highways. And uh, the thing that you'll notice on a state level over the last 10 years, we've gone from about 10% bonding to about 22% bonding, or 22% of the budget goes to pay off the bonding on the state level. That's, those are dollars that are not available for us in our general transportation aid. Um, in 2000, uh, well, in 2016, we also adopted the vehicle registration fee for a one year period of time. Recognizing that we had levy limits as a county, our ability to raise taxes was limited, our general transportation aids were plummeting, not taking into consideration inflationary pressures or inflationary pressures at 5.5% per year increase in our cost to, to do our work on, on the highways, but in real dollars, our transportation aids were lower. In last year, even with an 8% increase, in general transportation aids, we were still below in real dollars where we were in 2010. 
Uh, and if you had kept pace with it, with 2% inflation, you'd be, we'd be significantly ahead. If we maintain the 22.5, we'd, we'd uh, have almost a million dollars more. And if we um, had that 5.5%, we probably wouldn't need the vehicle registration fee. But the fact is, is that our partnership with the state has been somewhat one-sided, and we have not, um, we have not enjoyed the increase in growth um, in our revenues necessary to reflect our, our cost. And last year, we also uh, adopted a resolution calling for a sustainable funding source. Um, uh, one of the, the good notes is, is that Craig Thompson is a new secretary of the Department of Transportation. Craig is uh, no stranger to the counties. He's worked for the Wisconsin Counties Association, and he worked for the Transportation Development Association, but he has advocated for a transportation plan that deals with all forms of transportation, multimodal harbors, airports, uh, roads, uh, and other activities. And, and I'm optimistic that we may have some changes coming out of Madison as a result of that. The, the, the governor has put together a task force. The assembly has historically supported increases in fees. Um, there have been, you, you, if there's been a bo bottleneck, it's been on the Senate side. And that's where we can come in and in, in our need to articulate from a county's perspective that we would like to be at that 30%. We would like to have inflationary um, adjustments. Without those and with the levy limits, we are forced to look at other options, which includes the vehicle registration fee. And that fee will be in place until such time as we have other sources of revenue to, to replace it. Our crews have done a, a phenomenal job of reducing costs for salt. Uh, spreading and, and other activities and looked for ways to extend lives of the, the roads through innovative uh, technologies and approaches and, and should be commended for that. But sooner or later, we still have to raise the money to pay for it, and that's what uh, we do through the vehicle registration fee. So with that, are there any questions for Jim? John, I saw in that, that uh, presentation they showed the wheel uh fees for the various counties, and I thought 25 was capped, and I saw one county at 28 and one at 30. If we went to 30, that's another 600,000 we could have available. I, I don't believe that there's a, a, a statutory cap. There, there is the probably the political cap. And I, I think that, what's the highest one, Jim? Waukee is at 30, 30 yeah. <coughs> Supervisor Schaefer. Kevin can probably answer this one. That the white machine, the crusher, we don't own. We just lease those, don't we? When we need them, that the big crushing machine. Yes. Okay. And then the other question: How does that spreader know to keep the black side up? You don't have to answer that. Yeah. I'll <coughs> Okay, all of those machines, the specialized machines other than the paver are lease machines. We do our annual bids for those. So um, the material transfer vehicle that we require with our asphalt, we don't have an asphalt plant, we contract that out too. So we require the supplier of the asphalt to also supply us with that machine when we're doing our paving. Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? Well, very good job. I, I want to thank uh, uh, the commissioner, highway commissioner, and, and uh, uh, staff for a great job that they've done in the winter storm that we've had and so far this winter. And uh, let's, let's give them a round of applause and all the highway department workers. Okay, we will move on uh, to item number 9A. Denial of a claim, Kyle Cluck Trucking and Excavating. Is there any questions from the board? Any questions on that agenda item? Okay, next we have item 9B, appointments, Land Information Council. This is appointing Robert Mayer Jr. to replace Linda Schroeder. Any questions on that appointment? Okay, ordinances from the Environmental Resources Committee, item number 1A, Marathon County, County Code Chapter 15, Private Sewage System Ordinance, Ordinance 1-19. Any questions? Supervisor Gums. 
Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I mentioned to you uh, at the end of uh, the board meeting or last month how um, the ERC committee held that hearing on I uh, believe 7th of February. Uh, townships did not receive notice of it till like the 20th of January. Most of the townships meet the second week of the month because of budget, the president's money, because of bills. So we felt it was, um, how should I say, really didn't want the opinion of townships because there was not a large enough time frame uh, to, for us to hold special meetings. It costs more money. We're pretty frugal out there. So uh, we did not, Town Holton did not get to um, voice their opinion. Um, but we last night we did have two uh, members from CPZ, uh, Paul and uh, Teal, came out to a general meeting. We had 40 to 50 people attend. We had our uh, assemblyman, Jimmy Boy Edming, there from um, Glen Flora. He also had an uh, attorney via phone. It was actually my uh, zoning committee meeting for a township, uh, which is separate from our board meeting. And uh, I want to share a few thoughts that they had put together after the th after the meeting, if you don't mind. It's a, just a couple min a minute here. Is that okay? Just go ahead. Okay, our zoning committee said, as a result of the meetings with town residents and Marathon County CPZ, the Holton zoning recommends that the town of Holton Town Board decline implementation of proposed SEPT existing changes for our townships. The committee unanimously opposes the replacement of current working systems. CPZ stated current systems would be need to be updated based on a Marshall Clinic study that was done over 20 years ago, which stated children were, children were becoming ill with viral diarrhea due to playing in septic-filled ditches. 20 years, 22 years ago, we're basing studies on. Um, town residents and farmers regularly have their water tested. You have to do that when you're selling milk. There is not sufficient information to needlessly financially burden residents with the cost and the maintenance of new systems. We all know there is not enough financial grants and loans for new systems. The burdens will be on the homeowner. The transmission power line fund would uh, should be divided equally, too, they felt. The 33 households attending the meeting last night strongly opposed the proposed septic system changes. Their systems are working for the past 50 years. Some stated even if they got fully grant, fully funded granted, they couldn't afford $100, $150 a month to pump the tanks. We also stated another interesting fact. Rural, rural Marathon County is the poorest part of the county. If there's a house that, say, is a $40,000 starter home for somebody, you can put a new septic system in for fifteen or twenty thousand, and it ends up being that much by the time you do re-landscaping to sell the house. The house is still only worth forty thousand. What happens? Nobody can sell the house. Another place, nobody can live. They felt that instead of trying to fix to something that isn't broke, some feel that Marathon County should address the real problem of drug abuse in our county that is hurting all our children today and every day. Thank you for letting me share this. Okay, any other questions on the ordinance? <coughs> Supervisor Guild. I guess following that statement, as a member of the ERC um, who voted to approve this Chapter 15, my impression was that this proposal simply cleaned up language in the current chapter and aligned us with the mandatory state statutes, that there were no changes, no enforcements. Um, so I, I guess I could use some clarification about, is there something about this chapter that aligns with what Supervisor Gums just alluded to, that we are making changes that are not approved? I, I would uh, refer that question to the chair of the ERC committee. Supervisor Langenhan? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanted to comment uh, to thank Supervisor Guild for explaining that. Uh, that is the intent of the changes to bring ourselves into compliance with current state statutes uh, with the code. I think that it might be uh, for the 
for the better benefit of the county board, if we have a, a staff member who uh, uh, is quite familiar with this code present at Tuesday's meetings, if you would all, if any of you would have any questions with it. So I think we should plan on that for Tuesday um, and we'll go from there. I've, I've already extended uh, that, uh, that invitation to the uh, department head to be here on Tuesday. Supervisor Gums. Uh, Sarah, I could uh, sort of explain. They sort of explained the whole um, way the thing would go down because there were so many questions and nobody understood how, what gets condemned, how it gets condemned, who decides this and that. And uh, the guy sort of explained the whole process a little bit. And that's where you get the, well, I don't think, you know, doing that really, do we really have to do this? And that's why you got the broad spectrum of inputs because they went through the whole process for us rather than just talking about your um, details and updates. We were just more trying to address the whole issue. And the reason I had these guys come out is like uh, the chair is going to have, because nobody knows, you know, kind of explain how this works because, uh, you know, you're always scared when you don't know how things work. And this is where this is all coming from. And I felt that people have the right to uh, be involved. And I also thought we needed to have our our representative, Assemblyman Jimmy Boy, come so he understood because he knew nothing of this. So uh, I realized they give you laws that you guys have to follow, but I also realized that the only way you get to change things is go through your state legislatures and um, kind of inform them. And I think we informed him the last night too. So that's what it was about, and I just wanted to share. Okay, any other questions? Supervisor uh, Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess it, it, as a practical matter, just so um, hopefully the Tuesday presentation will give us what the real life impact is of the changes, whether it is just a language update to come into compliance, or is there some type of enforcement? I mean, I, I think that's a very real, real very valid question, um, which nobody seems to really have the answer to at this point. And I, th I think that's important that if we have folks available that they're here to give us that answer. Well, I can, I can, I, in my earlier years on the board, sat on the uh, Land Conservation Zoning Committee. In 2008, the state passed a statute <clears throat> saying that all counties will come in compliance with inventory of all of the POUTS systems out throughout the state by 2019. And so since 2008, we've known about this and uh, we're now moving towards, and we've, and have always, anytime that there has been a complaint filed uh, with the CPZ department about a failing system, they would go out and inspect it, and uh, if the if there was visual uh, drainage on surface, that would be considered a failing system, and then that system would be required to be replaced. Some of the code language that is being offered in this uh, ordinance uh, update is just that. It is some of that language that is updating in compliance with state statutes, and then it is moving forward with the requirement that the state mandate has thrown on the county uh, eight years ago, or 10 years ago. So it is to try to come in compliance with the 2008 legislation. Any other questions? Okay, from Infrastructure Committee, item number 2A, amending the general code to designate ATV and UTV route County Road F, Town of Halsey, Ordinance 2-19. Supervisor Schaefer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the next couple of these, do you have to have a driver's license to drive a ute? Do you have to have $25,000 minimum liability insurance? Uh, I... You have to wear a helmet. Is a county subject to some type, if I'm on that road and somebody hits me with a ute, 
I'm not talking about the little kid utes like in New York. I'm talking about a UTV. Does that person have to have an X amount of insurance like anybody else traveling on our roads has to have? We have the commissioner, highway commissioner here, and we have the, the chair of the infrastructure, and I don't know that they know the answers to those questions, but we can, uh, if they do know the answers, I invite them to address that. If they do not know the answers, I would invite them to bring the answers to this, this board for Tuesday. Jim? Let me, let me just explain what's coming before you. These are bringing to the county board actions that were taken by past infrastructure committees, including those that you served on. Well, where, where um, some of these were historic in, in nature and in looking at our policies and procedures manual in light of some recent requests that we've had relative to County Highway Q, uh, we found out that we were not following our county ordinance and that these not only needed to be approved by the committee, but they needed to come to the county board for ratification. So we're playing some catch up, if you will, uh, for some <coughs> permissions that were granted to use our county trunk highways over the years, con consistent with the understanding uh, of what the policy procedure manual was, but not with what the ordinance was. Jim, do you want to answer the liability? As far as the other questions, uh, no, they do not need a driver's license. It's the uh, same as if you're taking a bicycle down that road. Um, no, they don't need to be 18. Uh, what we did in our in our ordinance is we need we followed all the DNR guidelines for ATV UTV usage. Um, so anything that the DNR had stated. Uh, again, these were we had talked about this quite a few years back when we had passed the ordinance that we would allow this, uh, we just never had anybody come forth for quite a few years. And we're not, we're not opening up the entire segment of the road, the whole stretch of the road, not all Highway F. What they are is intended to be short segments. Uh, I'll give the example of the Highway F one. Um, they're looking for a short segment because the township has opened the roads and the Big Rib River runs through there. So they can't do it from one road to the other road without going on their county highway. Uh, so what we're looking at uh, is opening up that short segment of road. Again, the board had passed the ordinance as laid out and presented probably about five years ago, um, but it's been a few years since we finally got somebody to come forward. And as John said, we had a couple of them that we had passed at the highway department level, infrastructure committee level. We just never had taken them through the ordinance procedure. Supervisor Boots. I, I would say exercise caution in this one. Uh, the town of Texas, we did ATVs three years ago. We put on in our general general code of ordinance that you had to be 16 years of age and have a valid driver's license. I think it's a slippery slope to just say anybody can ride an ATV down a county road. Okay, any other questions? Supervisor Schaefer. So if we make an exception here, what about on Highway S going over Big Old Plain if somebody says, the only way I can get down, I mean, I have a place up north, and one thing that burns in my rear is all of these people on the town roads and on the county roads in Lincoln, Oneida, it's recreational. They're not paying for those roads. Some roads, they have to stay on a blacktop. Highway A north of Tama, you have to stay on the shoulder. So you're going up Highway A, and here's some guy on a ute going 40 miles an hour, throwing you know half-inch pea gravel all over the place. <laughs> If I agree with Supervisor Boots, when if we don't put some conditions on here, this is going to just keep jumping to road to road to road. Supervisor Gums. Mr. Chairman, I believe the DNR sets the conditions on these things. I don't think you can set your own, unless I'm mistaken. Any other questions? Any other questions on this issue? Supervisor Boots. Uh, to, to Supervisor Gums, you can set your own conditions in your code of ordinance, absolutely. Okay, any, any further discussion? <coughs> any requests for additional information on these, uh, the, those next four items for Tuesday? Supervisor Schaefer. No time, what about the insurance? No one's addressed the fact that if you're on a municipal route, you have to have $25,000 minimum liability insurance on the state of Wisconsin. What about a Ute? Can we, can we, does our, does our ordinance request or require 
It does not. Supervisor McEwen. Vice Chair McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> a UTV or ATV, is, you, you are not required to have insurance to operate on the roadway. Oh. Your mic is off. <clears throat> okay. Um, in Wisconsin, you do not have to have insurance to operate an ATV, UTV, or a snowmobile on, on, a, on a roadway if they're allowed by the township or village. Supervisor Schaefer. So uh, I see our corporation council found a fountain of your youth. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> he was, yeah. Our other corporation council was busy in Madison today. Good. <laughs> I hope he prevails. Anyhow, if we can have a legal opinion on, you know, what can we put on this if we, uh, can we make him be 16 like Supervisor Boots says? Can we make him have minimum state liability insurance? You know, if, if we can get something from the Corporation Council. I will look into that and we'll have something for you guys on Tuesday. Okay. Any other questions on uh, number uh, 2A? Okay. I'm assuming you want the same information for 2B, amending the general code of code to designate ATV UTV route, County Road Q, Town of Ringle, North Route, Ordinance 3-19. Unless you want me to go through all the same ones. <laughs> I, I, we'll provide that information. Any other, any other questions? Okay. Uh, amending the general code to designate ATV, UTV, Route, County Road Q, Town of Ringle, South Route, Ordinance 4-19. Amending the general code of a code to designate ATV UTV route, County Road F, Town of Spencer, Ordinance 5 19. Okay. Resolutions. Item D. Number one Human Resources Finance and Property Committee. Uh, Postponed from uh, the January meeting, initial resolution authorizing not to exceed $2,295,000 general obligation promissory notes for capital improvement plan projects, resolution 4-19. Okay, number D, 1B, resolution declaring official intent to reimburse expenditures on capital improvement plan projects from proceeds of borrowing, resolution 5-19. Item C, approved 2018 budget transfers from Marathon County Department of Appropriations, resolution R-9-19. <coughs> Item D, approve 2019 budget transfers for Marathon County Department of Appropriations, resolution 10-19. And Human Resources Finance and Property Committee, Health and Human Services Committee, Item number 2A, amend 2019 budget to create up to three FTE economic support specialist positions in the Department of Social Services and provide funding via the state Wisconsin Enhanced Funds, Resolution 8-19. Okay. Any questions? Okay, um, Environmental Resources Committee, North Central Wisconsin Stormwater Coalition Cooperative Agreement Renewal, Resolution 6-19. And number 3B, DNR Lake Grant, Building a Community Capacity, Water Resource Protection, Resolution 7-19. And last but not least, Infrastructure Committee, resolution to release a controlled access rights state 
Road, Village of Hatley, Resolution 11 19. Okay, moving on. Announcements and or requests. Supervisor Robinson. The infrastructure will try for a third time to meet um, in, on Tuesday at, at 6.30 so we can um, take action on the items that are before you. We'll just be acting on the items that are on the county board um, at that time. And we will be deferring the other actionable items until our May or March uh, 7th meeting. Supervisor Rosenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to give a shout out to uh, Josie Bartoshovsky, who's from Wausau, who became the first uh, female wrestler in Wisconsin history to win a WIAA regional title. It's pretty awesome. So good luck. Keep, keep going. Supervisor Stark. I just wanted to uh, remind the uh, Human Resources and Finance Committee members that we have a meeting on Monday at 3 p.m. here. Okay, any other announcements and or requests? All right, I'll take the final and Supervisor uh, Nutting with the motion and Supervisor uh, Chong with the second. Any discussion? All those in favor of, of uh, adjourning, signify by saying uh, uh, aye. aye. Opposed, we stand adjourned. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Monster could eat, eat right through that.